Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We have not dug into the seal nectar for a while, and I'm feeling like it is the perfect time to read it. We're almost done, anyways. Look, we got only a little bit left. All right, look at that tiny little bit left. So let's just bust it out so that we can add another book to the reading list. Go ahead and listen to this as you are exercising, you are chopping onions. You are mincing garlic. Whatever fun thing that you're doing. Alright. It was during this visit of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to Mecca. For pilgrimage. That his uncle, Abbas, and I'll be pleased with him, offered the hand of his sister-in-law, Maimuna, may I'll be pleased with her, the daughter of Harith, to him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was kind enough to accept this offer since it was an effective step towards cementing the ties of relationship between the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the influential men of Mecca. The wedding took place in Sarif. Okay, they got married in Sarif. Okay, and that's Maimuna. Narrators attach different designations to this Umrah. Some called it the compensatory Umrah, performed instead of that incomplete, during the incidents of al hudabiyah and the other one, given preference by jurists, is the Umrah consequent to certain terms of a treaty already agreed upon. On the whole, compensatory, judicial consent, retribution and reconciliation are all terms applicable to that visit. Some military operations directed against still unyielding Bedouins took place at the conclusion of the lesser pilgrimage of which we could mention. One. Okay, so unyielding Bedouins. A platoon of 50 men led by Ibn Abu Awja, I'll be pleased with him, was dispatched by the Prophet, peace be upon him, to the habitations of Bani Sulaim, inviting them to embrace Islam. But all the worlds fell on deaf ears. Fierce fighting took place between both parties during which the Muslim leader was wounded and two of the enemy were captured. Oh, look at that. The tribe of Sulaim. Two, Khalid bin Abdullah, may I be pleased with him, at the head of 200 men, was dispatched to Fadak, where they killed some rebels, and a lot of buoy fell to their lot. Three, Banu Kuda, the tribe of Kuda, had gathered a large number of men to raid the Muslim positions. On hearing the news, the Prophet, peace be upon him, dispatched Ka'b bin Umar al-Ansari at the head of 15 men to deal with this situation. They encountered the army and called them to enter into the fold of Islam. But the rebels gave a negative response and showered the Muslims with arrows, killing all of them except one who was carried back home later seriously wounded. Wow. So the tribe of Kuda ended up killing all those 15 men, or 14 technically. Wow. Talk about intense. Think about how the Prophet, peace be upon him, had to give that order and how he reacted to the news afterwards. That all those people had died. That's pretty intense, man. They got sent to their death. But they had died as martyrs. And martyrs get into Jannah. Four. There was also an insignificant clash. That occurred in Rabi al-Awal 88H. Shuja bin Wab al-Asadi. May Allah be pleased with him. Along with 25 men. Marched towards Bani Hawazin, the tribe of Hawazin, where they were encountered. Oh, where they encountered no resistance but managed to gain some booty. Okay. No, now we're in a new section titled The Battle of Muta. It was the most significant and the fierce battle during the lifetime of Allah's Messenger, peace be upon him, a beginning and a star to the great conquests of the land of the Christians. It took place in Jumada al-Ula, 
8AH, September 629CE. Muta is a village on the borders of Greater Syria. It is a relatively short distance from Baitul Maqdis. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had sent Al Harith bin Umar al Azdi, may Allah be pleased with him, on a mission to carry a letter to the ruler of Busra on his way. He was intercepted by Shurabil bin Amr al Ghassani, the governor of Al Balka and a close ally to Caesar, the Byzantine Emperor. Al-Harith, may Allah be pleased with him, was tied and beheaded by Al-Ghassani. Wow. Whoa. Ugh. Ugh. You're traveling on a mission and you get beheaded. So here, again, you think about the Prophet, peace be upon him. How he's sending these envoys, they're getting killed. Talk about intense battles. Some of us can't even handle a tweet storm, let alone someone we care about getting beheaded. Killing envoys and messengers used to be regarded as the most awful crime and amounted to a declaration of war. That's true, yeah, historically, right? That's why we have the saying, don't kill the messenger, right? The Prophet, peace be upon him, was shocked on hearing the news and ordered that a large army of 3,000 men be mobilized and dispatched to the north to discipline the transgressors. It was the largest Muslim army ever mobilized on this scale except in the course of the Confederates' battle. Yeah, they beheaded him, man. Al-Harith bin Umar al-Azdi. Zaid bin Harith may I be peace with him, was appointed to lead the army. Jafar bin Abi Talib, may I be peace with him, would replace him if he was killed. And Abdullah bin Rawa, may I be peace with him, would succeed Jafar in case the latter fell. Good, they have the lines of who's going to take over in place. A white banner was raised and handed over to Zaid. May I be peace with him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, recommended that they reach the scene of al Haris murder and invite the people to profess Islam. Should the latter respond positively, then no war would follow. Otherwise, fighting them would be the only alternative left. He ordered them, quote, Fight the disbelievers in the name of Allah. Neither plunder nor conceal booty. Kill no children or women, nor an aging man or a hermit be killed. Moreover, neither trees should be cut down nor homes demolished. End quote. Hermits! Because, <laughs> you know, the hermits are just minding their own business. They don't know what's going on. Right? I don't know. That one, I like that one. <laughs> yeah. Just essentially go for the age of the fighting men. That's great. The army prepares and Abdullah cries. At the conclusion of the military preparations, the people of Medina gathered and bade the army farewell. Abdullah bin Rahwa, may I be pleased with him, began to weep at that moment, and when asked why he was weeping, he swore that it was not love for this world, nor under a motive of passion with the glamour of life, but rather the words of Allah speaking of fire that he heard the Prophet, peace be upon him, reciting. Quote, there is not one of you but will pass over it, hell. This is with your Lord a decree which must be accomplished. 1971. Think about the faith he has. He's about to go and do some military preparations. Armies, you know, bustling about. He's weeping, he's emotional in terms of his constitution at that time. And some might thought, oh, you're crying because you're afraid to go to battle. Rather, no, he's thinking about hell. And it makes sense that he would think about hell because he could go die. He's going to die. Right? Well, I mean, he thinks he's going to die, right, in the battle. 
just takes like one quick arrow in the blink of an eye, and there you are. The prophet, peace be upon him, and the people then accompanied the army until they reached the valley of Thania, where they stopped, and he, peace be upon him, supplicated for them. So he, so he prayed in front of the army. So our prophet, peace be upon him, prayed in front of his army. Some people think that praying is a form of weakness. That if you pray when you're about to fight, it's a sign of weakness. But I want you to think more deeply. We obviously don't think that. But sometimes it takes a bit convincing for people to see it in this light. Think about if you are a military commander and then you see the leader of the opposing army praying but playing with a very fervent heart. Not weird like they're dancing around with a goat head or whatever. But just praying and you're like, huh. That's intense. It's sort of like the way in which we see martial arts fighters of, you know, Muslim ones praying. There's, I don't get impressed when I see a Christian doing it because, I don't know, there's just something about someone having a tattoo of the Virgin Mary or something and they use all these drugs that you're just like, it's not the same. But when you see a sincerely Sharia law-abiding Muslim praying before he enters the octagon or before he goes in the boxing ring, there's something very inspiring about that. It's like, there's a difference between the showboatiness of a McGregor versus the stoic seriousness of a Habib. It's very interesting when you think about it. The army marches and holds a council at Ma'an. The army marched northward to Ma'an, a town bordering on greater Syria. There, news came that Heraclius had mobilized a hundred thousand troops together with another hundred thousand men of Lakum, Judham, Balkane, Bahra, and Bali, Arabian tribes allied to the Byzantines. The Muslims on their party had never thought of encountering such a huge army. They were at a loss about what course to follow and spent two nights debating these unfavorable conditions. Some suggested that they should write a letter to the Prophet, peace be upon him, seeking his advice. Abdullah bin Rahwa, may Allah be pleased with him, was opposed to them being unwilling and addressed the Muslims, saying, I swear by Allah that every object which you are trying to avoid is the one you have set out seeking martyrdom. In our fight, we don't count on number of soldiers or equipment, but rather on the faith that Allah has honored us with. Hasten to win either of the two, victory or martyrdom. Oh, yeah. Nice. Look at that. Victory or martyrdom. Win either of the two. Makes it quite a good binary. Encourages you to rise to the occasion. For the men to not cower in fear. I want you to think about the masculinity of that. Telling the men, you're either going to be a martyr or you're going to win. That's all you got. They had swords. They literally had to worry about arrows going through their eyes. Swords. Slicing up that gut and having everything spill out. Okay, how much bravery that. Being trampled by cavalry, Camel and horse. Right? They were quite brave. So it really troubles me when you see very fragile men saying that no one should have the right to own a firearm. Because here you could see these men had weapons and they were not afraid to use it in times of great strife. Today you see Muslims willingly giving up their weapons and then wondering why they're going to get oppressed by governments. It is quite, quite sad. They don't make the connection. It's quite sad. All right. We'll leave it off there because the next section, I don't want it to bleed in and then we don't have time to finish it. So we learned quite a lot. Very unique section, I would have to say. 
It presents the facts for us in a very palpable way. The Battle of Muata. Okay. We learned about a lot of things occurring by Syria. Okay. And Al Harith, remember, he was tied and beheaded by Al Ghassani. That was Al Harith bin Umar al Azdi. So he was carrying a letter to the ruler of Basra. And he was intercepted by Shurabil bin Amr al Ghassani. Whew. Pretty intense, you have to admit. And remember that this was a very large battle. Okay. A lot of soldiers were being mobilized on the same level of the Confederates' battle. And then remember that Zaid bin Haritha was going to lead that army. After him, Jafar bin Abi Talib. And then after him, Abdullah bin Rahwa. Now remember, Abdullah bin Rahwa, he was a dude who was, who was crying because of the Quran Ayat 1971, which spoke about hell. So think about the bravery these men had and think about what type of men were appointed to lead the men into battle and the spirituality and the, the spiritual masculinity, right, of these people. So Abdullah bin Rahwa, he was not afraid to show his deep passion and spiritual nature. Today we think men who cry are not masculine. There's a distinction between crying because you're lazy and crying because you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to teach boys the difference is very essential, right? Cry due to the fear of Allah, the passion you feel for the religion. Don't cry because somebody ran over your Xbox game with their bicycle to punish you. Or because your parents took away your Xbox. I wish my brother could learn that. He's addicted to his video games. One of my brothers, that is. Actually, two of them. So, very unique lessons for us here. By the way, if you'd like to join my blog, it's www.subscribestar.com slash Archive. I think you'll enjoy it. I write longer form content on there. Can't post too much on YouTube. You know, YouTube deletes things. I'm already kind of shadow banned in the algorithm. So it's better for us to come and talk and chat and philosophize and whatever else on my blog. So consider joining and take care.